Hello and welcome to Table Talk. I'm your host, Karen Wilson, and I want to welcome you to the show. I have a very special guest today. He is the founder of BEDS Teen Outreach Center, Mr. John St. Clair. John is the father of Brandon St. Clair, who took his life in the winter of 2019 at the age of 14. So we've got a very powerful story to tell about Brandon and some great resources to share if you know someone or you have a teen that's going through struggles right now. Welcome to the show, John. Thank you very much. Yeah, so we've been talking for a while trying to, you know, coordinate this, and, and I think it's a good time for us and it's always a good time to talk about issues going on with teens and how we help teens young adults younger children older adults it doesn't matter everybody has struggles in mm, life very much so tell us about um, just about Brandon himself let's bring him to the forefront that's a lot but he was a very interesting young man I mean I've met a lot of kids you know because I just like kids so um, he was very interesting. Um, from a young age, he loved to take things apart, build things. He always was building robotic hands out of cardboard and stuff. Uh, he started getting into uh, video games and computers just because I am. So, you know, naturally you take on the role of a, of a parent, you know. So um, he started getting into computers very heavily and taking things apart and learning how things worked. Um, and then as soon as he got to about middle school, he really started loving his friends. He loved to have friends. Mm -hmm. you know, very early on, we were informed by the schools, and obviously we knew it at home, too. He loved making people laugh. Mm -hmm. Very like, social. He, yes, very social. He always wanted to joke, and, and, and he always would bring home new jokes, you know, trying to make us laugh, like little kid jokes, you know, and, and he was always wanting to make everybody happy around him and laugh. and. Um, he was always playing jokes on us at home and hiding and, and trying to jump out and scare us and set up traps for his sister in the hallway, things like that. Um, and then in middle school, uh, we very much started noticing that, that he started becoming more of a protectory kind of guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Like um, telling us about he was talking to a friend and, and, you know, they're not having a great time at home or, or tell us about something that Mary was sad, you know, my, my daughter was sad, so he'd let us know about that before she would tell us. We started noticing that about him. Um, uh, he didn't so he have a... he was a thoughtful kid. He was very, very thoughtful. Deep. Very deep, very thoughtful, always wanted to know everything of what was going on, why, he had a lot of whys. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, all kids do, but his was more of like, why can't I drive now? Why can't I walk all the way to school from five miles away? You know, why can't I go into Walmart by myself at the age of 10 and buy whatever I want, you know, with your money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So he really wanted to be independent, and toward the end of his life, that was some of the last things that he had told us, was, you know, um, I feel like an adult trapped in a kid's body. Um, I don't know why I can't just do what I want to do. Um, we started learning that. He, he's, if he would have gave himself some more time, I think he would have, we, and he would have realized he was what most people call like an old soul. Mm -hmm. You know, he started getting to the point where he was really getting deep with us, with mm -hmm. himself. So he was very, very interesting. Very interesting. Well, and a lot of people with those characteristics, it makes me think of like they almost take the weight of the world on their shoulders and feel like they want to fix things that are wrong in the world but you know they kind of struggle with that maybe they don't yeah. know how they feel like they're too young so that's very true yeah and, uh, we noticed um shortly after brandon chose to take his own life um we were told that by several of his friends um all the way back into sixth grade that he had talked a young girl out of suicide mm -hmm. uh, he had stopped two of his friends from self-harming um and then we found out after his funeral and, you know, through friends, he did 
all kinds of little things for his friends. Um, there's one girl that he brought Oreo cookies to every morning, like two or three Oreo cookies. Uh, another girl, every single day when they woke up, he texted her, good morning, beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, to make her feel better about herself every morning. He had, and he did, there, there was 10, 20 kids like this, all in this little circle. We had no idea that he was doing any of these things. I mean, now it makes sense. Now I know why I was spending $25 a month on Oreo cookies. I had no idea where they were going. Right. And he never told me he was doing these yeah. things. So all these little things, like, came together for us. I'm like, that's why he was doing that. And that's why he always never wanted me to see his phone first thing in the morning, you know, because we told him no boyfriends or girlfriends to both kids until you're at least 16. Mm -hmm. You know, so him saying I love you to somebody, to a girl, it would make me ask a question, right. so he probably felt embarrassed. So he never wanted me to see his phone in the morning. But all these things make sense, and he never came to us with any of these things because of the way things are today. You yeah. just don't. Well, and that's a very what I would think of as a private time in a, a, a young adult's life. They kind of like keep everything so protected and they internalized um, that they don't tend to tell you about everything. And that I think is what makes it so difficult to know what's going through their mind is they're internalizing. They might tell a friend, but they're not gonna tell mom and dad very much unless it's just really rough. So around that time, did you, like looking back, did you have signs that um, maybe he was in distress or was it just totally out of the blue? Just well, it's, back. it's hard to say that because now we know, mm -hmm. but then it was absolutely not an option. It was, it was so far out of our minds that it wasn't in our minds. Yeah. Like there was no unhappiness between us. Um, the only things that were going on in Brandon's life that we knew about, you know, he kept a lot to himself, that, and we don't know why he kept things to himself like that. We were very, a very talkative family. Mm -hmm. We had like family meetings mostly because of me, I would say family meeting, you know. We'd have family meetings about everything, where we're going out to eat that weekend, what we were doing, where we're going on vacation. I built our basement. We moved to a new house right down from the high school. Um, the basement is completely designed around the kids. There's karaoke, a pool table, hundreds of pictures all over the wall, famous singers, and they loved having their friends over. And then we had Halloween parties for all their friends and Christmas parties and birthday parties. And there was no indications, there was no signs at that time that we knew of. Right. Because we were not educated at all. Right. We didn't know we had to be educated in such things. Right. Um, the only things that were near there uh, was a couple of bullying incidences that we knew of, you know, but Brandon thought he had his bullies under control mm -hmm. by the time he hit high school. Mm -hmm. um, his last year of, of middle school, uh, he had a bully, but they confronted each other and toward the end of the year, he said he thinks that they were starting possibly to become friends. Yeah. Uh, going into ninth grade, we warned him and told him about, well, bullying's a lot different in high school, you know. Um, he didn't have to deal with a lot of the bus ride because his sister started driving, so he became a, a car rider. Mm -hmm. um, so he said that was a lot, lot easier instead of having to sit on the bus. But he said there were still a few bullying incidences, but he never complained about them. Mm -hmm. You know, and we made it a habit since sixth grade with both kids, you know, or fifth grade, every time they came home, anything happened today, everything okay, any problems with any other kids, any problem with teachers, and then the same normal parent thing, you know, how much homework, did you get it all done today, this and that. We, it was such a habit that it was just immediate, as soon as they walked in the door, everything cool, any problems? Mm -hmm. And he always said no, he said yes once or twice. Right. And I was like, really, what happened? He's like, oh, this, this kid pushed me, or this kid said this, or. I'm like, are you, are you all right, you know? Or his mom would say, you okay, you know? Do you, is it a big deal? No, 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 it's not, it's, it's cool. Mm -hmm. He never told us anything about girlfriends, you know? Probably because there was the rule of no boyfriend or girlfriends to 16, so he kept that to himself. And we found out later that he had a, a couple of girlfriends. Mm -hmm. So there was probably a little bit of heartbreak in there, you know? Well, yes, that comes with that but age. I didn't know this, so right. there, it took my opportunity away to talk to him about that. Even though he knew everything he needed to know at his age, you know, um, he didn't give any indications he was having, having any struggles mm -hmm. with bullies or with girls or with schoolwork or anything. 
in in hindsight, do you feel like that maybe you have diagnosed him with anything depression, or is that just something that we kind of think isn't it? You know, it can, like you said, come out of the blue. Or do you feel like he had something like that, like a medical issue or anything that you didn't if know I were about? To, if I were to have to say that, take myself out of the equation. I mean, I have to do that with just about everything. If I took myself out of the equation as his father, I would normally, as an adult, say he was just going through what kids go through. But here now, knowing everything that, that I know now and talking to the tremendous amount of families and kids and school personnel and, and counselors and things like that, I think that it's all of our faults for these kids. Mm -hmm. They are surrounded with depression, anxiety, self-doubt, uh, drug-riddled families. Um, slow moving processes that help them, mm -hmm. um, an overabundance of information on the internet, and it's all slamming into them at once. And we as adults are just moving along as if it was still 25 or 35 years ago. Yeah, we want to throw that. Well, in my day, I had yeah. somebody do this, and this is what I did. You know, that's exactly and, correct. And it's very, very different. It's now. very different now. It, it's the same as if we were to take ourselves and and expect us to handle our current situations, our current lifestyles, our current needs, and drop us in the old wild west. You know, like we wouldn't have internet, we wouldn't have cars, it would take us long. You know, we wouldn't function properly for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're expecting them to do because a lot of the parents, older parents like me, you know, in their later 30s and early 40s, mid 40s, those kind of parents that are dealing with teenagers, we're expecting the same type of respect. Uh, we're expecting the same amount of understanding that we gave our parents. We're expecting the same amount of no back talk. Um, kids are smarter now. Kids want more. Kids want to do more. They're geniuses, and we don't even realize it. Everything that we think they know, we should times it by a thousand. Mm -hmm. I mean, th Brandon already knew how the birds and bees work when he was nine, and I had no talk with him. Mm -hmm. But all the kids at school had internet and told him all about it, and he figured it out, and kids are smart. Mm -hmm. he, he knew. He knew how to do things on computers that, to this day, I still don't know how to do, and I think I can do everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, they're a lot smarter than we give them. So it's for me to diagnose Brandon with any kind of mental illness, I think it would be um, the social media bug, the mm -hmm. social media disease. Um, he was surrounded with depression and anxiety. All of his friends were, were depressed. They were having problems, everything you've seen on the internet. It, I mean, the world. Yeah, yeah. The, I it's mean, a everything. Lot on we their removed shoulders. TV. We removed TV from our house and just had like Netflix and Hulu mm -hmm. just because commercials alone most of the time were, and then the news, you know, it's just, it's too much. Mm -hmm. So. But you, it's hard to take away that. You know, I can remember when my kids were in middle school, that desire for that phone, yes. you know, and, and they were relentless in until they got it. And then I felt like I had opened up Pandora's box. That was it. And no. um, they take on this whole world that you're not a part of anymore, that you're, they're seeing things, they're getting texts, they're getting, they're in group chats, they're on these chat rooms and things like that. And... We're over here in our other box playing mommy and daddy, you know. And Working little do 40 we know, to 60 hours a week. Yes. And little do we know all the conversations, the images, the, the things that are being. It's a tremendous amount of information. It is. And as you said, some people, some children are very uh, sensitive to things like that. They take the weight of the world on their shoulders and feel like, you know, totally beat down, I guess. By and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Like they, most of them really don't know what to do with a, that amount and that kind of information. Mm -hmm. So they ask a lot of questions and they think that half of it's okay. Mm -hmm. So they just go with it. Hey, this is the world. So it's okay that I talk to people this way and act this way. And I'm allowed to do these things because this kid's doing it. Mm -hmm. Why can't I do it? Because they are. Mm -hmm. 
it, it's and it, and it really twists a parent's arm behind their back and, and red tapes us as parents because how do we combat that? How do we alter that when all we know is stand in the corner, take away the car keys? Like, what else can we do when they say, hey, you can take everything away from me, I'm still walking out the door. Mm -hmm. And they're 14 years old. And then you are left with a choice of runaway charges or something like that just to try to keep your kids safe. Mm -hmm. Because they truly feel that they can do whatever they want, that they can leave if they want to, that they can go where they want to hang out with whomever they want to, date whoever they want to, regardless of the age. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it makes it really, really difficult. Yeah. It's, they want the world, it seems like, but then they really can't handle, they're not at 14 years old and no. younger, not ready for all of the intenseness that the world brings. They're they geniuses. Have, yes. But they don't have those coping skills not yet. Not yet, not yeah. quite yet. Yeah. So, um, I guess I think of things on a local level. I know there are a lot of things going on out at the world, but you know, let's bring this down to uh, Middle Tennessee within the state and stuff. Do you feel like that you know there's progress being made um, for resources or just t discussion, talk? Um, do you feel like that there's some education that people have? Uh, they've They've educated themselves on these things. I think that we're moving in that direction. Um, I'm a very impatient person, so I don't like starting at the bottom. I don't like, you know, wasting time, wasting days, especially when it came to this. So I immediately went as far as I possibly could at the moment without overstepping too much so well I, I kind of did so I went straight to Congress like right away in the beginning straight to Congressman Desjardins straight to the White House straight to Governor Bill Lee um, I went straight to everything I wanted to find out how much funding was being put forth for free mental health care uh, in the school systems public private I went every direction all wow. at the same time and it's zero mm -hmm. There's nothing in the state of Tennessee or 37 other states that directly help mental health children to That's this amazing. day. amazing. Now, there is mental health available to them. You know, basic counselors in schools. Um, there's paid counselors, psycholo psychiatrists. You can go to these places. Then there's, you know, Child Advocacy Center and the, the health department. Um, but I'm not... I don't like, um, it's very difficult to word it right without hurting feelings, but I don't, I don't think any of them cater whatsoever to children, mm -hmm. even the ones meant to cater to children. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe is it reactionary instead of proactive, you know? I think it's... And it's maybe temporary reactionary, like they're, it seems like when something like that happens, a lot of people get really like, oh, we gotta do something, we gotta do something. And there's a little talking that goes on and then it's forgotten about that's until the next that's process. That's very, very, very true, very true. There's a lot of talk, especially around election times, especially around budget times, you know, trying to get more money for budgets, things like that. But my, my biggest find, my biggest, wow moment through all this was how comfortable everybody is in their positions and how rudimentary it seems that they act toward their jobs you know at say child advocacy centers around the world around the United States I, I'm sorry around the, around the United States how they immediately classify and and label and uh, a kid reaching out or a family reaching out for help or a call on a crisis or a welfare check. Um, it's how quickly it's, oh, we've been there before, they're fine, and so they take their time mm -hmm. and they get there next week or the week after. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a lot of that. 
in a lot of red tape, mm -hmm. especially for the school systems. There's a tremendous amount of red tape. You can't always blame the school, mm -hmm. you know, because um, well, they've got a lot of red tape. Are they overloaded? All of them are overloaded. Every single one of them are overloaded. Uh, I've probably filed, I think, about 275 cases, 265 cases of through DHS, DCS, DHS, I never say it right, and the Child Advocacy Center, like directly with the families, not with the resources, but with the families, just in case they needed more help. So I could try to help get them a free counselor or something like that. And I mean, almost every single one of them, I mean, it, it, they wouldn't see their worker for weeks and weeks, three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. They mm -hmm. would call every other day. The worker wouldn't respond for weeks at a time. Uh, and they, the kid would be in serious crisis to the point where the moms and dads would drive them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. or take them themselves and have to sell their car in order to pay for the $4,000 psychiatric for stay for four weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, And, and it's all said, because of the stigma that mental health isn't real, that, that there is no such thing as child depression or anxiety. And, and, and unfortunately, this is a huge unfortunately, religiously, a lot of families here in the Bible Belt I don't know if it's because of the religion or because they were raised so deeply rooted in a religion, but they, they just literally dismiss the child's depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. With the child sitting there crying, saying, I, I'm, I'm feeling suicidal, mm -hmm. I'm having panic attacks at school, mm -hmm. and, and they literally tell them, we're going to church, we'll pray about it. Mm -hmm. And then that kid is in the hospital two weeks later, and they cut the wrists or took in pills. Or, yeah. Because sometimes, I mean, that's great, uh, you know, not dismissing anything like that because that is an awesome place for your children. But sometimes things are more immediate than that, and there can be uh, medical and chemical things going on yeah, that needs much. an immediate response instead of praying your way through it. And I do not mean that disrespectfully because I'm Neither do I. a faith-based I'm, person I'm, myself. I love religion, and no matter which religion it is, but a kid reaching out is a kid reaching out. Mm -hmm. And if that kid is in need, going to church, when they're telling you that they're having a medical condition, such as anxiety, depression, self-harm issues, mm -hmm. I don't think going to church will immediately solve that. Mm -hmm. uh, getting closer with your child, I mean, I mean this is now, mm -hmm. 150 years ago, it was different. Mm -hmm. You know, 40 years ago, the way we were raised, it was different. Mm -hmm. You listened to God. You listened to your pastor. You listened to your mother and father. Their words were the end all be all. That's what's going on. It was different. When I was young, let's say my mom, if I went to her and told her, I'm really depressed, and my mom said, go outside and play. <laughs> You'll feel you better. Need some sunshine. You need some sunshine. <laughs> Here's some tea or some Kool Aid, some yeah, lemonade. Have a cookie. And it would make me feel better because that's. That's great. Kids want to go outside and play. But kids don't want that these, now. Mm -hmm. They want a new video game. They want to be with their friends. They want their phone. They want to be able to text at 3 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. regardless if they're allowed to or not. They'll, they'll still want to do it. They want to go to somebody's house that you don't know and hang out with 20 other kids with a mom who's never home. Mm -hmm. So you have no idea what's going on there. That's what they want now. And if you don't give it to them, they become depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so like, just like that. If, and then they have to tell their friends why they're not coming. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be looked down on at school the next day. And like, if you follow the route, if you follow their, what they went through that week, and here it is Friday and they're wanting to go to their friend's house, you have no idea what that kid's went through throughout that week. Mm -hmm. All you know is that you've been at work and you've came home tired every day. You've put food on the table every day and your kid went to school every day. Mm -hmm. You guys talk at night, everything seems fine, but you yeah. have no idea how many breakups that kid went through that week, how many of their friends breakups went through that week. And just because you're an adult and that's not important to you does not mean that that is the entire world to your child. And their whole world just ended at the end of the week because their boyfriend or girlfriend broke up with them mm -hmm. and their friends don't want to talk to them because they didn't come over to a party on Thursday night. Right, they're not and cool now. And they're not cool now. Or they didn't get the shoes they needed or their mm -hmm. phone broke and you can't afford to get them a new one right away mm -hmm. so all their friends are not talking to them. Or they felt talked down to. Or talk, yeah, or they were or being something. bullied at school. Or I mean, there's a million things that are happening to these kids in one day. Mm -hmm. And here it is the end of the week and they want to go over to a friend's house and you're too tired and you say no and they just stomp off to the room, 
you don't think anything about it. Mm -hmm. You don't think anything of it. Like and I told I my kid, say, no, that's you're it. not an advocate of the, the solution to this is not giving in to what it, the kids want as far, because no, I, not you know, really. They're not. It's more of I'm an advocate of figure out a better way, mm -hmm. a new way to communicate between the adults and the young people. Mm -hmm. Figure out a different way to where they understand you and you understand them better. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost like this step between the two, um, especially here in the South. You know, it, my word is law. Mm -hmm. In my house, this is what's happening. And we don't talk about certain things. Yeah, we don't talk about this. If you're gonna cry, cry in your room. If you're gonna whine, go throw a fit in your room. About half the time that I've been told that that's what's happened, and the kids have told me, or the parents have told me, the kid has turned to cutting, the kid has turned to stealing, the kid has turned to drugs, um, fornication, other things to try to get some kind of outlet or to get some kind of attention for their, for actually what's hurting them, bothering yeah, them. Yeah. If I think that if we want to succeed, succeed parents need to be more open to their kids. Mm -hmm. They need to tell them why they're saying no in a normal manner as you and I'm speaking now, not in a because I said so manner. Right. They need to treat these people because they're not kids like they used to be. Mm -hmm. They're not kids like we were. Mm -hmm. They are young people trapped in adult, tra or I'm sorry, young adults trapped in kids' bodies like my son said. Yeah. And some of my son's words make so much sense now. You know, um, and all these kids that I've been talking to, almost every one of them, that's what I felt from them, exactly what my son said, an adult trapped in a kid's body. I'd like to thank John for coming today and sharing his story with us. We've got a lot of education to cover, so we're gonna break this down into two episodes. Uh, today, we've talked about Brandon and some of the things that he went through um, and some signs um, if, if a teen is in distress. Next week, we're gonna come back and talk more about the BEDS program and the outreach center that John and his wife, Laura, have established. So thank you to our audience for joining us today. We welcome you to come back again next week for more Table Talks.